And we're going to talk about monoamines. So we were talking about serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And when we talked about the OG theory, the monoamine theory, we know that we're probably going to want antidepressant drugs to be drugs that are going to increase the levels of these. Serotonin is the monoamine that most is the target for most drugs and that most neuroscientists are like, think is more involved. And, but dopamine also has some pleasure and reward seeking effects, some attention and motivation effects. Noradrenaline, which is again, norepinephrine, noradrenaline, fight or flight. Adrenaline is going to give you some en energy, um, increase your alertness and concentration, also increase attention and motivation. So if you can increase dopamine, you can help some of these things that were problematic in depression. If you increase norepinephrine, you can help some of these things that were problematic. And with serotonin, we think of serotonin as like the happy drug that just makes you feel better. Um, this this one doesn't have a lot of it. Um, serotonin affects sleep and memory. Um, it can affect things that are in terms of just calmness and, and just feeling good. So we're going to look at this whole list of antidepressants. And basically, you can just go, we're going to look at some combination of these, all our drugs are just some combination of these three. So to remember about monoamines, and I've been using that term thinking, oh yeah, you went back and reviewed this. But to remind you, monoamines are going to be serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Doop, doop. And then we're going to break that down into catecholamines and serotonin. So these guys are the catecholamines. And then we're going to break those down into dopamine and norepinephrine. So all we're going to talk about actually physically breaking these down. We have monoamine oxidase enzymes and we have COM-T enzymes, catecho-O-methyltransferase, and monoamine oxidase, and those should be on your definitions. Um, so we're gonna see, if, if you're looking at what's gonna break down all three of them, you're going MAO. MAOs are gonna break down all three. The only ones broken down by COM-T are gonna be dopamine and norepinephrine. So if you have a role and you're like, I just want to hit it all, I want all three increased, then you're going to want to inhibit monoamine oxidase. And if you say, I don't want all those side effects, I want to be a little bit more specific, then you might go for inhibiting COM-T. If you want to be even more specific, then we can go to reuptake inhibitors. The other factor here in terms of the MAOs is that there's a couple of different subtypes, MAOA and MAOB. Because they're subtype enzymes for monoamines, they're all, A and B are all going to be able to break down all three monoamines. So A will break down all three, B will break down all three, but not with the same um, efficiency. So MAOA is much better at breaking down noradrenaline and serotonin, and MAOB is much better at breaking down dopamine. So if you're using a drug and your clinical purpose is just to break down, is just to increase dopamine levels, then you're not going to try to break down to block MAOA. You're going to try to block MAOB and get your dopamine levels up. And if your whole goal is to increase noradrenaline and serotonin, and you don't want to increase dopamine much, then you'd want to block MAOA so that you could increase those. 
So we actually will have drugs that are for Parkinson's, that are MAOB drugs, because you want to increase dopamine. And we have drugs for depression that are MAOA inhibitors, because you want to increase serotonin and norepinephrine. So that relationship between these and those, those enzymes really does matter. And we'll come back to those. So when we talk about strategies to increase monoamine levels, this is what a neuroscientist loves, right? If you want to ask me what a drug does, the first thing I want to do is say, what's the synapse look like? Where are, this, where are the sites we could make a drug? And so if it's a monoamine, let's just say um, the sites at which you can make a drug would be you could increase synthesis enzymes or precursors, anything that could increase synthesis. You could increase signaling at the postsynaptic receptor so maybe you could have a direct agonist. So that wouldn't actually increase the monoamine level, but it would definitely increase the signaling of that pathway. You could have mon block an enzymatic breakdown. So you're blocking the breakdown, so that means your neurotransmitter le level goes up. You could block reuptake inhibitors so that you have a buildup of the neurotransmitter in the synapse. And you can block intracellular enzymatic breakdown. So you have more of that neurotransmitter in the presynaptic membrane, presynaptic area. And then it can kind of go and be reloaded. So I'm gonna say that again, because I think I said that pretty fast. Somebody at a drug company comes to me and says, I want you to increase dopamine levels. I go, that's fine. I can increase making dope substrate. I can increase the synthesis of dopamine. I can have an actual agonist at dopamine receptors to increase the dopamine signal. I'm just using dopamine as an example. I could block breakdown of dopamine so dopamine stays in the synapse longer. I could block reuptake so that dopamine stays in the synapse longer. And I could block intracellular breakdown so that all of the dopamine that did get taken back up goes right back into vesicles and they get, they get loaded much higher. So we're gonna look at drugs really that do all of these. We want to, for this lecture, memorize the effects of serotonin and norepinephrine. And at first, it is going to be kind of a memorization. Um, we have the neurotransmitter notebook. And what we want to do is basically just recognize what are the major, the global effects of increasing dopamine or decreasing serotonin or increasing norepinephrine. Like not every single drug is going to do every single one of these, but it's just like if you asked me, um, what do people feel like when they smoke nicotine? I could give you a general answer that most people are going to feel most of those things. It's not going to be the same for every, every situation. But if you know that, you, you have this idea of generally if we increase serotonin, this is what we can expect, then you're not memorizing the side effects for every drug class. You're going, okay, if I know this increases serotonin, then I know it's probably going to have these effects. And now, as a pharmacist, I'm learning that, in fact, this drug does have this, 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 and this. But this one's a bit of an outlier because it doesn't have the final one. So we're going to go through all of the different neurotransmitters as we do this course. But again, I'm going to try and bring them in one at a time as we're doing um, the different disease states. So here you're going to be looking at serotonin and norepinephrine. I would hope that because you guys did cardiovascular pulmonary, that you have some real good 
idea of what norepinephrine does in the body. So when we look at serotonin, I made, there's basically three major roles. You have a lot of gut roles. So people taking serotonin agents can have different effects on um, constipation and diarrhea. They can have roles in vasculature. So increase in serotonin can constrict um, blood vessels. And it has a lot of effects in the CNS. So when you're looking at a drug that we say, oh, hey, this new drug blocks serotonin receptors, you're the first thing you're thinking is, oh man, we're gonna have some gut issues. We could have some blood pressure or stroke issues. And we're gonna have to look at a bunch of these CNS stuff. So I drew kind of a little guy here for serotonin. Do whatever you want to to remember it. But um, I have this little guy partying so hard to add his B party that he, that he got hot and got a migraine after he puked. So we can look and see why that is the case. The neurotransmitter notebook information here on this side says pro serotonin possible effects. So more than likely, if you get a drug that increases serotonin, it will increase your mood, be anxiolytic, so decrease anxiety, it can be pro-nausea, so a lot of, of serotonin increasing or serotonin, um, pro-serotonin transmitting drugs can cause nausea. We can be anti-migraine. We use some of the trip downs we do use have are focusing on serotonin symptoms. Has really specific effects on gastric motility depending on which receptors. Um, you can get hyperthermia. At high doses, you stop being able to sweat and your hypothalamus actually stops being able to read and control your blood body temperature. And then there's another thing called serotonin syndrome that very high doses of serotonin can cause. And that's something that you'll be looking about at when you talk about toxicities. Decreased serotonin levels, which could be if you just happen to have decreased levels, like someone who has uh, and has depression, or you take a drug that's anti-serotonergic, you're more than likely to see depression or dysphoria. Dysphoria was that lower mood state. And, and the way to memorize, to remember dysphoria in you is that um, euphoria is the best show in the world. And euphoria is when you feel really good. And dysphoria, because it's dis, is then feeling really bad. So low serotonin uh, signaling can cause depression and dysphoria, can cause anxiety. It's anti-nausea and it decreases gastric mobility. So again, knowing as a pharmacist what each of these neurotransmitters might do can help you to think about, oh yeah, maybe I want to block diarrhea, but do I necessarily want to cause anxiety and depression doing it? Maybe there's a better drug. So go ahead and kind of review these. Uh, we did talk about the different types of receptors. Um, when we talked about um, at the beginning in foundations, but focusing right here on serotonin, filling in the actual exact enzymes and receptors for serotonin synapse. So up here was kind of like a generic monoamine. Here's the specific serotonin one. You're gonna have tryptophan, is synthesized into 5-HTP, which LAADC is L-amino acid decarboxylase is going to make into serotonin. That's going to go into a synapse with a vesicular monoamine transporter. That's going to come down here, dock here, filled, filled vesicle sitting on the synapse, you're going to get an action potential come through. That's my, my action potential with your sodium 
and your potassium. That charge is going to open this calcium voltage gated ion channel, which is going to bring calcium in. That calcium is going to come over here. It's going to trigger release of the vesicle. The serotonin is going to come out into the synapse. Serotonin has G protein coupled receptors and it has lichen gated ion channels. And the two major ways that serotonin is taken out of the synapse or gotten rid of is by CERT, the serotonin reuptake transporter, or by intracellular monoamine oxidase A. So I want you to understand that and, and understand how we go from tryptophan all the way back through release, reuptake, and breakdown. But you don't have to memorize all of it. So I'm going to show you what I actually want you to like be able to tell me. So you don't need to tell me what the precursors are, but you do need to know that LAADC, L-amino acid decarboxylase, is part of uh, an enzyme that synthesizes serotonin. You need to tell, be able to tell me that we have G-protein coupled receptors and lichen gated ion channels. You definitely need to be able to tell me that serotonin is taken out of the synapse with the serotonin reuptake transporter and that it's broken down intracellularly by the monoamine oxidase A. So those are the things that you need to really be able to tell me just happened. So we talked about serotonin, we talked about it having gut, vasoconstrictive, and neuronal effects. Well, we also wanted to talk about noradrenaline, right? Um, norepinephrine and noradrenaline are the same thing. Epinephrine and adrenaline are the same thing. Usually, I'm not going to hold you to this, but it's just if it helps you to know this, um, the nor ones are generally the neurotransmitter ones. And the ones that don't say nor are generally the ones hormo acting hormonally through your entire body, like released in the bloodstream. So when we think about the effects of adrenaline, we're thinking fight or flight. We're looking at, at having significant cardiovascular pulmonary effects. Any of the other fight or flight autonomic nervous system effects that you already know. So I'm not going to go through all the fight or flight autonomic effects. So I want you to go back through those and, and re-familiarize yourself. Um, and then again, has a lot of CNS effects. So if we're getting chased by a bear, we want to be anxious. We want fear. We want anxiety. And here I'm just asking you to kind of take a look back at your IST-1 cardiovascular pulmonary and find those drugs that you covered there that were acting at the adrenergic systems and just kind of make a list here of those drugs so that you can, as we talk about more of these drugs, you can kind of set those side by side and recognize um, that some of the pathways that they're both acting at. And so this is the noradrenergic uh, synapse and its effects. The proadrenergic effects were arousal, which is just another term we use for being awake. Um, doesn't mean anything other than that. Um, causes panic attacks, causes increased heart rate and blood pressure, dilates the bronchioles so that you can get more air in there, can cause autonomic instability at high doses and at very high doses can cause seizure. Anti-adrenergic effects then can cause sedation, decreased panic, decreased heart rate, blood pressure, bronchoconstriction, and orthostatic hypotension. And so as you're looking at different drugs that you might be told, oh, you can use this drug to decrease panic attacks, 
Well, okay, that's great. You're decreasing panic attacks, but what other things are going to come along with that in the package? Here you've got the um, synthesis and noradrenergic synapse. We actually make noradrenaline from dopamine. So you're making dopamine. It's going into the vesicle, becoming norepinephrine. Vesicle goes and docks, action potential comes, release calcium into the cells. The noradrenaline gets released into the synapse. We have, again, G-protein-coupled receptors, alpha G-protein-coupled receptors, and beta G-protein-coupled receptors. And I want you to go back to your cardiovascular pulmonary and remember what those alphas were for, what those betas were for. Because if you start giving a noradrenergic drug for a psychiatric disorder or a neurological disorder, you damn well better know what it's going to do on your blood pressure and your cardiovascular and your respiratory. So norepinephrine then has three different ways it can get, bro get broken down or out of the system. It's broken down in the synapse by this COMT, catecho-O-methyltransferase. It can be re taken up again through norepinephrine reuptake transporters. And then within the cell, that norepinephrine that was taken up is broken down by monoamine oxidase A. So if I wanted to increase noradrenergic levels and signaling I could increase synthesis. I could use an agonist to directly activate those alpha or beta receptors. I could block breakdown through COMT. I could block reuptake through norepinephrine transporters, and I could block breakdown through MAOA. So it's worth going through and quizzing yourselves on these um, these pieces of information so that as we go through and we're talking about different drugs, you know exactly where they act. Got some more questions for you. And now we're going to talk about antidepressants themselves.